All righty. Welcome back for another episode of Two Plane Sports. Um, today has been kind of a crazy day, as at least when we're recording it. Uh, the 2022 class on Twitter has been going crazy. Uh, Kobe McKenzie and all the other guys have been stirring the pot and turning some heads, that's for sure. Um, you know, a few other things we're going to talk about is maybe a few guys that I think or that we think that could be associated with all this craziness and this and these rumors and um, potential and what the Sooners are going after. Uh, but before we get into it, we just want to say we really appreciate it. Um, we we've grown tremendously in the last two weeks and more than we could have ever expected. And we really hope to keep this rolling. And we, we, we like to hear your feedback, uh, you know, good or bad. It doesn't matter. We, we like to hear both sides of it. If you hadn't already hit that uh, subscribe button, turn on the notification bell so you can keep up when, whenever we post a video um, and make sure to definitely comment and then follow us on our Twitter uh, and Instagram at two plane sports. And if you don't like looking at us, we're on Spotify Two plane sports as well. Um, all that will be linked in the description below and um, definitely keep spreading the word and, and we really appreciate it. So uh, we'll get into it. So overall, this is kind of an over overall look at what today and we're recording this on Sunday, um, the 19th and the 2022 class uh, for Oklahoma has seemed to really bond together. Uh, they all seem to be in tune and as a unit and working together and on the same page, which is really great to see. I mean, if, if you guys haven't been on Twitter, um, almost every commit, if not every, I, I don't know. I, I've, you know, we follow a lot of them. They've been tweeting, uh, LOL, um, ha ha, uh, the lock emoji. I mean, various things. And, you know, this has been, this kind of came out of nowhere. I feel like, um, I don't know if Kobe McKenzie was the first one to do it. I feel like he was the first one, at least I saw doing it. Um, I don't know. As we're recording this right now, Kobe McKenzie has tweeted out six different locks and another one in LOL. And he's swearing that it's different people, um, which is hard for me to wrap my mind around that six kids, whether it's new recruits, transfers, uh, flipping kids. Six is hard for me to wrap my mind around. Jose, what do you, what do you, th what do you make of all of this? This is, this is insane, actually. It's beginning to look a lot like flipness here, bro. Yeah. Where Brent Venables is doing what he does and he's putting in the work in the recruiting trail. And in regards to Kobe, uh, I, I believe he was the first one to put out a tweet to, in reference to any of this. And Nick was shortly followed shortly after both of them seem to be the leaders of this class and it, it makes a lot of sense kobe was the guy that was the longest commit to oklahoma before his temporary decommitment and then coming back and nick is a quarterback you know people always look at the quarterback fans players coaches the quarterback kind of has a good temperature of the room so he's he's a clear leader for this class right now and these guys are i think while it is it sucks from you know perspective of looking back just three weeks ago where where Oklahoma was we we thought we were going to be in the big 12 championship and potentially in the playoffs and then we got disappointed losing losing in Bedlam Lincoln Riley left abruptly and then we all pretty much I would say that it was almost it seemed like it was like 80 percent of fans were thinking that you know shit hit the fan and you know to and for lack of a better term and people just thought Oklahoma was gonna die you know we were never gonna recover from Lincoln Riley's abrupt leaving and I I I have been saying this a few times and Brum I know you're you're pretty calm about it but and and Joe Casiglione we had a trust and he made the right move Brent Venables came back he had a long history at Oklahoma he's definitely what Bob Soups would call a program guy full loyalty and wherever he is coaching. I don't, I wouldn't suspect Brent Tabard leaps leave so abruptly like Lincoln did. Um, and now kids are kind of seeing that you, we have the Oklahoma culture is about loyalty and hard work. And that's not to say, I don't think Lincoln Riley put his guys to work, but this is going to be a different level. This is going to be a different culture. We're going back to the, you know, two thousands where 
we have Schmitty just running these guys to death and making them just absolutely transform their bodies and their, and their mentals to, to really push them and, and be championship contenders that we know a team under Venables could be. Um, and it's going to be fun. It's going to be fun to see what the next few months are going to be. Who are these six locks? I'm excited. I, I know it's, I mean, there's, there's a lot of players we're going to speculate about today, but I, I just hope, and I, I think that the six players, if it is six individual players because of the six locks, they're going to be guys that are going to fit the culture that Brent Venables wants to establish. Yeah. I, and there must be, you know, I guess backing up, it felt like at the end, when this all broke with Lincoln Riley, it felt like this 2022 class was left for dead. And people were just like, man, everyone's going to decommit. They're going to go play wherever. People are all going to transfer and they're going to barely be able to feel the roster to go play in the bowl game. And, Sorry to interrupt, but yeah. gutted was the exact word used by almost every national pundit, anyone covering what was happening. No, that, that's 100% right. I, I mean, I know we came out of a video saying that the Sooners aren't gutted. And I get that was an easy reaction. And there are a bunch of people that left, transferred, you know, decommits, whatever. But it felt like this this class was left for left for dead. And I think that I think you brought it up before. It feels like this has bonded them together. And now we're seeing this actually it's proving that they seem to be all in it together and seem to genuinely like each other. I'm not saying they're all best friends, but it seems like that they're probably in a giant group text or something. They're somehow all communicating and they're all already, you know, working as a team and they must be working on these, you know, six kids potentially and trying to convince them to be become Sooners. I mean, it's great to see, you know, Kobe McKenzie, the quarterback of the defense, and you got Nick Evers, the actual quarterback of the offense. Um, it makes a lot of sense. So I think, you know, the first guy, and we've talked about him to, you know, in depth and whatnot, is potentially one of the six could be Javante Barnes. Um, he he very well, you know, he's the Las Vegas running back. Um, you know, he was supposed to sign during the early national signing day, and he's going to uh, announce his commitment um, next month at the All-American game. I feel like he's one of them. Um, not that he's a flip or anything, but I feel like, that's that's likely one of the six um we've talked about him a whole lot if you hadn't already go check back on some of our videos with with some recruiting updates he was in most of them oh in the last last month or so so uh do you have anything to say about him or or anything about that i'm pretty confident javante is one of those locks not just because he's been kind of trending towards oklahoma for months now and we had expected him to do a silent commitment and not just not make his official announcement till the all-american game but usc was the only rather real big competitor in this scenario with javante from what has been reported and they still haven't been able to find find a running back coach they had one temporarily. Um, the guy from Georgia Tech, I can't remember his name. And I apologize for that. But now he went from Georgia Tech to USC for the same position and then from USC for about five days. And now he's at Texas to coach the running back. So, I mean, kind of karma for Lincoln. But now USC is left with no running backs coach and Javante has a great relationship with Oklahoma's running back coach, all time Oklahoma great and DeMarco Murray might as well just go with what is actually stable in at Oklahoma. Yeah. And you know, it's funny, just a little bit on that is a website called the Trojan wire. I think it's, it's some USC, right. You know, a posting website or website um, for discussion for football. They, um, they post an article about how ridiculous it was that, he came in for five days and has left. Now he knows what Lincoln Riley's doing and all this other stuff. And I'm just thinking to myself, come on. I mean, really, you were just celebrating it just a few weeks ago, and, and now you get burned by a running backs coach. Now you're upset. I don't know enough about that, but I just thought that was kind of funny. Um, but, yeah, I, I do agree. I think he's going to end up being a Sooner. It's stable. you got a great coach. You know what, you know who your offensive coordinator is at this point. Um I don't know why he wouldn't want to be a Sooner at this point. It sounds like a bunch of turmoil in his position at USC. Yeah. Uh, so another guy uh, we've brought him up before is Jaron Kanick. 
he could be potentially one of the six as well. So that's two of the six, um, you know, six foot two, 210 pound. He's labeled as an athlete from uh, Hayes, Kansas, number 252 overall, number 10 athlete in the 2022 class. He's a four star. Um, we talked about him. He's, you know, he runs track, runs an extremely fast uh, hundred meter dash, hard hitting linebacker flies around the field and can, you know, shoot the gap and all that stuff. And, he seems to be pretty, you know, he's committed to Clemson right now, but it's more of he's committed to Brent Venables. And since Venables has obviously left, he seems to be really determined to become a Sooner. And, you know, Venables is not trying to step on Davo's toes about recruiting kids. But at the end of the day, it seems like the kid wants to be a Sooner just because of Venables. I think Davo Sweeney would understand. Um, I think it's time for Venables to open up, a, you know, an offer an official offer, a committable offer to him. What do you think? Yeah, that I agree hundred percent. And we, and we talked about it offline. This is in a situation where I understand, you know, Venables has, you know, has a stance on how he's going to move forward with the relationship he has with Dabo and Clemson as a university, he's not going to step on any toes and actively recruit kids that are committed to them. But in this situation, this young man wants to play for you and he wants to play in your defense. I wouldn't I I wouldn't expect Dabo to be just absolutely heartbroken if Venables made start making start to make moves on a recruitment for him. This he, he wants to be a sooner. Almost every recruiting expert has gone ahead and crystal balled him to Oklahoma. And these guys are just randomly pulling these numbers out of their butt. Like they've got information, if not direct communication with, with the recruit, they have someone that's kind of helping them out with getting this information. And to me, Wolfong is the most trust trustworthy in regards to just recruits around the country. Um, because clearly, you know, you we have our insiders for each school that are gonna be more favorable to your school. And Wolfong is pretty um kind of straight to the point. Doesn't he doesn't really care what there there's no loyalty to, for him really. So he he Wolfong thinks he's gonna be a sooner and he's pretty confident about it. I think he has it as a seven on two four seven out of ten confidence. So it's just a matter of time at this point. Now again, believe that's one of the locks, one of the six locks as well. Yeah, no, I, I definitely agree. And that's a guy that I'm extremely excited about. Anytime you can get a kid that is 210 pounds and can run like a 10, was it 10, five hundred meter dash or something. It's something crazy like that. Extremely athletic. Um, pretty, pretty good stuff. Venables right, effect nostrils. already. So there's two out. Of, yeah, there's two out of six. All right. So three out of six here. Here's one that we're just thinking just because of recent offers and just timeline. Um, R. Mason Thomas. He's six foot two, 215 pounds, edge rusher out of Fort Lauderdale, Florida. Uh, he's number 413 overall, number 23 or number 29 edge rusher. Uh, he's three star in the 2022 class. Uh, from the little bit, um, I, you know, did a little bit of research on him. He seems to be extremely athletic and can really pass rush extremely at, well at a high level. He's in his 2021 season, he's got 21 sacks. Um, his high school team just won the state championship, I think at 4A or 5A, I can't remember. Um, he's currently committed to Iowa State. And I mean, before we, before I say anything else, you know, Iowa State's been on him for a long time. And uh, Matt Campbell, this just speaks to his ability to evaluate talent. Um, you know, OU's kind of came in a little late. That, um, that's pretty impressive. I mean, talking about how late they've come in, uh, Kentucky offered on October 28th. LSU offered on December 3rd and Oklahoma offered on December 10th. Uh, Chavis has been in his home on December 9th. So it was visit on the 9th, offer on the 10th. And, um, you know, just recently he's been picking up a bunch of offers from power five schools, you know, bigger power five schools. Um, you know, obviously 12 sacks in a season and you want to stay a championship. Um, you know, you must be doing something right. What do you think about him? Yeah. In regards to how he was recruited by Oklahoma, I think, one, it definitely shows how much homework this coaching staff is doing and really seeing how, how the kid plays, how it could potentially transfer into the system. And two, the fact that a lot of the guys, um, and you know, I guess really talking about this guy specifically, but it's a common theme that we've seen so far 
with our coaches go in to to talk to them in person before they make any sort of official offer. And Chavis did that with a guy we're going to talk about here in a little bit, and Ahmad Moten. I believe he also they also went to go see him before he got his official offer. So they're they're not just saying if they're really talented kids, they're making sure that they are talented and have the personality they're looking for. And Thomas has shown that he can be that person that can add a lot of value to the culture and the play at Oklahoma. And and hopefully he decides to to flip his commitment to to OU because that defensive line is going to definitely need a little bit of development here over the next year or two with, with our three big guys going to the draft. Yeah. And you know, he, he's been committed to, to Iowa state for a few months now. He just visited Kentucky uh, last weekend over the 10th, actually right after Chavis left. Um, he went and visited Kentucky and there's a chance that he might visit in January. And um, he seems to be pretty open he must be enticed to maybe go play at a bigger program than Iowa State since he's starting to get offers from Kentucky, LSU, and Oklahoma. Odds are it's he might pick up a few more between now and then uh, as the dust is starting to settle on the early national signing day and teams need to fill it out. Um, I would imagine between Venables and Chavis, they were evaluating uh, our Mason Thomas before they even went to Oklahoma, and they just must have already knew, like, this is what we want to do. And Venables is the head coach and he can ultimately decide to offer. Maybe Dabo Sweeney didn't think that they needed to offer him. I don't know how that whole dynamic worked, but they seem to be moving really quick. Um, do you have any final thoughts before we move on to the next guy? All right. So that's three out of six. Uh, here's number four, Amon Moten. Uh, he's six foot three, 290 pound uh, defensive lineman out of Fort Lauderdale, Florida, teammates with uh, Mason Thomas. And he's the number 568 overall kid and number 81 defensive line, three-star in the 2022 class. Um, in this last year in their state championship run, he had three sacks and 39 total tackles. Um, he's picked up a ton of offers. He's got offers, and this is just recently. He's picked up offers from Oregon, Kentucky, Florida, Tennessee, LSU, and Oklahoma. And this has been in the last few months. So a bunch of bigger schools are coming in with offers for him as well. Um, uh, according to his 247 profile, uh, he's scheduled to visit Oklahoma on the 21st of next month in January. And that's why I'm assuming that our Mason Thomas is going to be visiting that same time being teammates. I figured you would go and visit with your teammate, not saying that, that they would. I don't know how close they are. Uh, they might. I mean, I would imagine they're somewhat close being both on the defensive line. Um, but it, they could be a package deal. And the fact that OU offered both of them has got to, you know, has got to say something. I believe um, Chavis also visited him as well. Um, while he did trip with Mason Thomas, I believe he also visited with Moten. What do you think about him? He is a big dude. He is very large. And it's going to be a different, really defensive line than we've seen before. It's going to be a lot more power, uh, maybe a little bit less speed, which – you know, I guess really just a preference at this point, but they're still going to be effective. Um, and Venables is definitely establishing his recruiting roots in Florida for the Sooners. That's something we haven't really had um, over the last seven years with Lincoln, um, you know, at, at the helm. He's dominated in California, but I, I, I think with our move to the SEC, we really have to establish some roots in Florida to be able to take and steal some of those recru recruits from Bama, Florida, FSU, you know, at pretty much anyone down south over there, and then go back to California. I don't, I don't think it's as hard as some of the some of these national commentators are saying it is to recruit in California. Like, yes, they're going to be more attractive now, maybe by staying at USC. But if you look back over the last five years, USC hasn't had an issue with recruiting they've had an issue with developing talent and i think now they they have the coaches that could develop them better than their past regime but people are still going to go in there and steal those those high school players to to leave california and go play for for better proven programs in their lifetimes because i mean we can talk about the usc history but in these kids lifetimes usc has not been that successful oh that's that's the truth is what what have you done for me lately and one, one final thing that I thought was interesting, you know, take it for what it's worth, 
uh, Robert Spears Jennings quote tweeted uh, Moten today. Uh, Moten said, I'm dropping my top four, top five, I think, here pretty soon. And Spears Jennings quote tweeted him and said, why are you going to drop a top four whenever you already know where you're going? And so I would imagine they're talking. You know, he might be within the group talking. And that's what's leading me to think that potentially he's the guy, uh, one of the one of the six. So there's number four, uh, potentially. Uh, like you said, the thing that sticks out to me is 290 pounds. Um, you know, with Grinch's philosophy, I believe I went and looked at the OU roster and along that defensive line. I don't think anyone's above 290 pounds um, that's currently on the roster, maybe 295. There's no 300 pound defensive lineman currently on that roster. And for a kid to be in high school already at 290 pounds, and he might be 300 right now, I don't know. We That would be the second guy that OU's been going after. You know, Tarver signed, he's 340 or whatever he is. And then you've got Moten. Moten will be playing at 310 probably in college. So like you said, total different difference in philosophy and something that suits better for the sec not the speed and being agile or whatever it's more of the run stuffing hard nose good defense uh, defense wins championships at the end of the day and i think that's what venables is doing and obviously venables isn't the only one thinking that this kid has a lot of potential considering all these other big big power five schools that have offered um do you have any Final thoughts with Moten? No. All right. So we've gone to four. Now we're at number five. I don't know if this kid is actually even going to be on campus at one point. I know he's generating a lot of buzz. Um, Jared Verse, uh, he's six foot four, 250 pound edge. And he played at University at Albany uh, in New York last year as a redshirt freshman. Um, he has three years of eligibility left. He has entered into the transfer portal. Uh, this past season, he had 10 and a half total tack or total sacks, 53 tackles and 11 and a half tackles for loss in 2021. So an extremely dominant edge rusher. He entered into the transfer portal, I believe just past, just after Thanksgiving. And, uh, he's picked up offers from Oklahoma, LSU, USC, Florida state, Auburn, and he's up to like 30 offers and they're all from power five schools. So he, you know, he goes from the F FCS level level and dominates. And now he's got like 35 power of power five con, uh, offers. I mean, that is incredible. He's already visited Tennessee, Florida state, Syracuse, and Houston, which I would imagine Syracuse and Houston are probably not much, you know, in the way of playing because in the last week he's picked up like five offers and Oklahoma is one of them. He tweeted it out a few days ago. Um, I think what OU can offer or sell them on is, you know, they've, de they've developed players from, you know, a different level, like a Juco player, like Perry on Winfrey comes to my mind. I know Perry on plays in the middle, but he came from Juco and now he's going to go, you know, get trapped in the NFL. Uh, what do you think about verse? I think the biggest thing to highlight on verse is that he is the first transfer. Uh, I, believe he's the first transfer to be recruited by this staff under Venables um, because coming into Venables as being the head coach he had mentioned that he was not a fan of the transfer portal and he didn't plan on utilizing it and then a few few days ago maybe even a week at this point in a press conference, he said he now plans to utilize the transfer portal to to fill out the roster and, and bring in the guys he wants to bring in. And I think that's really important, and that just shows the flexibility he has to have now that he he runs he runs a program like we we expect success at Oklahoma. We're not going to settle for less. And while I believe he's doing the right thing with you know looking at guys out of high school and he has his philosophy on the transfer portal, the transfer portal isn't all that bad. And if used in the, in the correct way, in my opinion, and this, this guy versus is, is using it in the way that I believe it was originally intended to and in helping promote kids that deserve to, to be in a better position to succeed in the long term, And then the long term being moving forward and going to the league this guy going from an FCS school and getting all these offers from power, power five 
schools shows that the transfer portal can work for players. And Oklahoma should be a front runner for this guy. I don't know if he is, but if he tweeted it, it must be a, a school he's at least interested in a little bit. And at this point, the one thing that's probably important is who's going to be our defensive line coach or interior defensive line coach. I know we have Chavis or Chavis. Sorry, I still don't know how to pronounce his name, but he's the edge coach. But we we probably need to have a little bit more stability there to show him who's going to be helping out with with the line because I would assume that uh, you know Miguel is going to be closely working with whoever that interior line coach is. So that's probably important to to help convince him. And I mean, we've got Venables. He's one of the best defensive minds in college football for the last 20 plus years. His name speaks for itself. And we, we kind of just have to talk. They have to talk about the full picture with him and what they expect Oklahoma to be on the defensive side of the ball. Yeah, I totally agree. They need to get someone hired uh, quickly. I'd imagine, I don't know, rumors are flying around. He's probably still coaching the playoffs potentially, and that's why Penables hasn't hired anyone. Um, you know, it's – I think the biggest deal with this kid is to get him on campus. He's got 30 – like 30 FBS offers. He can only go to so many schools. If you can get him on campus, I feel like Venables and uh, Chavis can um, sell him on the vision. Uh, it's just that's going to be the big thing. Can you get him on campus? I mean, he's at you know going to school in Al- Albany, New York. Got to get him all the way down to Oklahoma. It's I feel like Oklahoma's going to have a decent shot to get him on campus. I know he's already visited a handful of schools. Um, I would imagine. I- I'm hoping at least that they'll get him on campus. So, uh, do you have anything to add um, to that one? No, so one last guy. So we've we've talked about five guys now, and this is a sixth one. And I don't know if I'm being more hopeful or naive or whatnot. We've talked about him briefly on a few other podcasts. Um, so the sixth and final one that potentially, I'm not saying that all these guys are going to be Sooners or whatnot, but there's reason to believe that they could potentially be, you know, maybe a handful of these guys are part of the locks, um, is De- Devin Campbell. Uh, you know, six foot three, 310 pound offensive tackle uh, out of Arlington, Texas. He's a five star, number 10 overall, number one interior offensive lineman. Um, you know, is there a chance? Is there a chance that he could be a sooner? I think so, with Beaton Ball being in the, you know, being kept in the fold. Um, they seem to have a great relationship. And I feel like if Beaton Ball wasn't retained, he would have been a longhorn um, already. And it's interesting that he's holding off till February. And um, I don't know, you know what I'm saying? I mean, could that be Kobe McKenzie saying that, you know, I think he tweeted back a long time ago that he's going to be bringing guys with him or flipping guys or, or they were coming back. Could Campbell be coming back? You know, he was leaning towards Texas and now I don't know. Um, we just, that's just six guys that we kind of came up with that, that we thought, what, what do you think about Campbell and the potential and, long-term outlook of him yeah i mean overall with the six guys we've mentioned i think they're all pretty solid it there there's all, all all of them are within reason of us actually landing them so specifically with campbell you made a, a great point and he the fact that coach b is still around is probably the reason why oklahoma is still in the running to get such a t- talented offensive lineman and i mean texas has been doing work in in recruiting offensive line if and if their nil deal is is in consideration for any of these kids is is besides the point they're doing what they have to do to improve their team and they've gotten a lot of big boys and we we have to do the same it like there's there's no other option at this point i know oklahoma and we can trust coach b to develop his guys but we need big men we win in the trenches and it's proven i mean and it's not just proven at, at oklahoma but it's proven across the country. You win, you win in the trenches, and Oklahoma did that with when we had a top tier offensive line and with Baker at the helm, and we had a really good one with Kyler as well. It's been going down a little bit, but the, that those lines were insane. They were all, um, you know, award winning offensive linemen for their position, so they were they were really good players at the college level, and 
we just got to get back to that spot. And Campbell can definitely be a great asset to to help us get back there. Um, so hopefully he he takes a couple more visits to OU here after the holidays. Um, but I think he's taking the, the right approach. I mean, if he's not feeling 100% confident in one school or the other, you know, take your time. Just because there's a national early national signing day doesn't mean you have to sign on the early national signing day. Really, I mean, traditionally, you you had till February. You know, you just finished high school football. Go enjoy your time off. Go spend time with your family for the holidays. Hang out with your friends. And then once you come back to school, then get back to business mode. You know, take take your visits. Talk to coaches. Have the coaches come to you. And really feel 100% confident in the decision you're going to make because – I would expect kids that make their decision in February to be the kids we're not going to see in the transfer portal anytime soon. They feel a lot more confident about their decision than the guys that did it on December 15th. Not that those guys were swayed one way or the other 100% by money, but money talks. It's made an impact so far in this recruiting cycle. And I believe kids that signed early, we're going to see in the transfer portal more likely than not at some point. Yeah, no, you, I 100% agree. And, you know, OU has to do whatever they can to get Campbell on campus again, because I know he's visited and um, sell him on the vision and, you know, winning in the trenches. And I feel like, you know, with how many commits Texas has already got along the offensive line, that class is pretty full. I could see why he'd want to slide in and be, be a sooner, but it's tough to say. And, um, you know, not saying that all six of these guys are of the six that Kobe McKenzie tweeted today, um, but there's reasonable, you know, there's some clues and tweets and, and various other things that kind of piece piece it together just a little bit. Um, you know, it's going to be interesting to watch. It seems like McKenzie's really taking, taking the reins and trying to lead this with, um, you know, Nick Evers. And it's good to see. And because... I think I, I got on they they're doing some Twitter space tonight or something and and Kobe McKenzie was in there saying that you know Venables basically told him if if you're not going to take over then who will you know that type of mindset on the defense so you might as well be that guy and he seemed to be stepping up with it um do you have any final thoughts before we wrap this up those guys are definitely up to something uh yeah. one of our friends who who is a little younger than us has is pretty good friends with Jaden Rowe and and Jaden can't say anything, but they have communicated, and he said a lot of good stuff is coming up. and And these locks are not just to hype us us up as fans. They're they're legitimate. Something is coming up. It's just a matter of time, and when we learn what's what's happening. Yeah, I would imagine another thing that would be a great selling point is if OU goes in and beats the brakes off of Oregon, or even wins, but they play really well. I think you're going to see even potentially some more kids be like, okay, wait, Venables, I know it's Bob Stoops, but a team seems to be rounding into form. I think winning that Alamo Bowl would really propel Oklahoma to that February signing day and this, would, would give them a lot of momentum. This could be kind of, a, I guess, a reset point. Was it Lincoln's first year that we played in – was it the Citrus Bowl against Clemson? I mean, we got, our, we got the brakes beat off of us, but – I mean, after that, we went to the playoffs a few times. Did all right. Oh, oh, are you talking about the Russell Athletic Bowl? Oh, Russell Athletic then? Bowl. Wait, was it? We, I know it was against Stabo and, and the Clemson Tigers. Oh, no, 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 no. You're, you're right. You're right. It's it's the Orange Bowl. Um, Orange. Gosh, I know. Well, both both those games. One was – we played Clemson in both those games. Yeah, we played Clemson one year, not in the playoffs, and then we played them again in the playoffs. Both times mm -hmm. we lost, but I mean, you know, it was kind of a reset yeah. there for, I believe they were both under Lincoln, I believe. Um, and I mean, after that, we kind of, I mean, we did show that we could compete at a higher level with a team like Clemson because Clemson was really starting to become a top team in the country. And I mean, after that, you know, history, history is what it is. We made it to the playoffs three times. And while it's unfortunate, we never won one. I know. Again, national media likes to say we just absolutely got destroyed. But if we actually remember those games correctly, we were in control of the game versus Georgia. And that was Lincoln's first time in the playoffs. And I think it was just a matter of experience. He didn't know something was something didn't go right. And we lost. Yeah. Then, uh, 
against LSU, we did get absolutely destroyed. But against Alabama, that I think the the Bama game is gets blown out of proportion a lot of time. It did start off bad, but we made Kyler push the team to be in a position to potentially win. And I mean, we definitely came back. Obviously, we didn't win, but it wasn't as bad as it could have been. Yeah, uh, it was the 2014 Russell Athletic Bowl, but Bob Stoops was the head coach. Um, I feel like that was the year. Gosh, I'm going back. I'm that they hired Lincoln Riley. Yeah, I can't. Because that was exactly. that was Baker's first year on campus. Because we were freshmen. Mm-hmm. I, I remember that. And then the next yeah. year, he he was a starting quarterback, if I remember all the yeah. timeline correctly. Yeah. So anyway, but um, yeah, a lot of good stuff. Um, you know, not saying that all six of these guys are the six locks, but there's some reason to believe that they could be. Um, but we're just going to have to w- wait and see. And and uh, we'll be sure to keep putting out videos as you know, more detective work we do on Twitter and various other things. Um, you know, if you hadn't already, I uh, make sure to hit that subscribe button. You made it this far. I mean, there's only like 16% of you that are watching, uh, or that are, that are subscribed that are watching. Uh, we'd really appreciate it. We can get that up to 20%. Uh, it helps us out a whole lot. Um, and make sure to leave a comment. Let us know what you think on these six guys that we talked about and any other potential recruits that maybe we're missing out on. I'm, I'm not saying we're covering everything because there's a lot of moving parts. Um, make sure to like that video. Uh, liking and subscribing helps us a whole lot. Follow us on our Twitter and Instagram at Two Plain Sports. Find us on Spotify at Two Plain Sports. And um, be sure to um, hang out and keep coming back and spreading the word. And we really appreciate it. Thanks.